what leadership is about is having a real clear vision on where ultimately you're trying to go and the organization is trying to go. Welcome, welcome to the Business of Happiness podcast. I am your host, Dr. Taryn McCarthy. And today we have a very special guest. I cannot wait to introduce you to this incredible man. He's a public speaker and business coach and has been leading and guiding organizations in the financial service industry for more than 20 years. He is the epitome of a leader of leaders and the host of Tomorrow's Leader podcast. So join me in welcoming Mr. John Laredo. Hello, John. Welcome. Thank you, Taryn. That was one heck of an intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. I am so excited to have you here today. This podcast is going to air on January 1st, 2021. So All here right. we are in 2021, John. <laughs> Crazy. Almost through 2020. <laughs> Can you believe we've made it this far? I mean, it's just so fascinating what we've been through. It has been an incredible, uh, 2020 was an incredible year. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for honoring me with this interview because I've been watching your success and your journey from afar. And so I feel like once again, I'm in a little bit of shell shock here, a little bit of uh, envy of myself for interviewing you here today. So thank you for doing me this great honor. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. It's my pleasure. So tell me from your position, what has 2020 meant to leadership? I mean, I just feel like it's taken on a whole new significance in our country and in the world. But yeah. how have you seen leadership change in 2020? Well, I, it's such a great question. 2020 has has pushed people in all different directions and businesses in all different directions. No one has really come out of this status quo and, and been on the same path. Some area of their life has changed, whether it's uh, business, whether it's relationships, whether it's finances, whether it's health, whatnot. I mean, we've been stretched in all different ways. Um, and there's a lot of good in that. Uh, I think people have realized, though, more than ever, the importance of leadership. And I'm a big uh, communicator of the fact that everybody is a leader. It's not mm -hmm. just, I think people used to think that, okay, a leadership, hey, I don't need to learn how to be a leader unless I'm in some kind of formal leadership role and I'm, you know, running a company or in some management position. That's not the case because yeah. you are leading yourself. And what I talk about is the importance of learning how to do that. Leadership is not something that you either know or you don't know or you're born with. You can learn how to lead yourself better. And when you do that, your whole life can change and the lives of people around you change and the organizations change. It's, it's, a, it's why I'm so fascinated and really obsessed with the topic of leadership. That's absolutely such a good point. I think I love that concept of that leadership, ownership of leadership leads off onto people around you. Yeah. I think that's such so evident, especially in families, but also in business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, people gravitate toward people that are good leaders of themselves that lead their life in a certain way. You know, we're all enamored by, or we tend to try to, to, to watch or see or spend time with people that, that really are kind of doing it right. And yeah. that's really that's leadership. It's making good decisions. It's managing your emotions and it's helping to, to get better, get better at communicating. Um, but this is a time and, and when people, people need, need people to follow now, they really do. They need people to look at as somebody who's going to guide them and show them the way. And the definition of what a leader is, has also changed a lot. There's a, there's a lot of people that, you know, look at the, the, the days of the leader who knows everything and is yeah. the go for everything is long gone. You know, people don't want that. They don't want so because fact of the matter is nobody knows, you know, we've gone through 2020 where, you know, that's it's been such a dramatically different year than anybody ever thought at the beginning of the year. And, and nobody knows the answers to, to where everything is going to go. And what I, so if if a leader is trying to posture as somebody who is, hey, I've got all the answers here's what you've got to do, blah, blah, blah. Then there's an, an inauthenticity there and people see that. And then there's a breakdown in trust and almost resentment that builds up. So I think there's a lot of people that have come out of this year learning a lot more about what leadership is. 
So if knowing everything does not make you a great leader, then what does? Empathy is one thing. You've really, the best leaders that I see are very empathetic. They really, um, and not just from the standpoint of it's a great human trait. I mean, it really is to be empathetic and understand someone's perspective and how they're seeing things and what they're going through and their feelings. But it also does help you become a better leader. If I'm working with somebody, it's hard for me to guide them to help them do the things that are the best for them and the organization, unless I can see from their perspective, what are they thinking and feeling? And if I can, then it helps me remove some of those obstacles, whether they're mental obstacles or other uh, uh, obstacles to help them do a little bit better. So I think empathy for one, uh, and, and the best leaders I've seen are very authentic. They're not trying to be somebody that they're not. Um, I started my career as a leader who was very inauthentic. Um, which I, and I wasn't intentionally trying to be, so I just didn't know what a leader was. And so I just tried to model myself after my leader at the time. Hmm. And my leader was a very different person than I was. He was very tough and, and a very low relationship and really, uh, you know, pretty much kind of like a bulldog. I mean, he was just, you know, do, 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 do. And, and that wasn't me. That's not that. But I was trying to be somebody like him because he was successful. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I guess that's what leaders are. And I remember a period where a time where where I had a friend who knew me out of work uh, closely, and then met some of the people that worked for me and learned the the John at work side. And and he said to me, he's like, you're like two different people. Huh? Like, wow, you're right. I am, and I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah. So when I started to really be myself, um, that's at work. And, and, you know, I'm a gregarious guy, I like to have fun. And I'm, I'm, I care about people immensely. And I, I'm relationship oriented. When I started to be myself, I, I wasn't that way because I thought that my level of influence would go down and the respect level would go down. It was the opposite. When I started to be myself is when the loyalty was there, the inf influence that I had, the results overall went up dramatically and it was just a light bulb. And I'm like, okay, one, I'm, I'm more, I'm enjoying this more and I'm able to impact people in a better way. And I'm having more fun. You know, this is, this is who I am. So, you know, it's really interesting. I think this is not the first time that we've heard that authenticity is such a powerful, powerful part of great leadership. But I think so many of us have a hard time doing that transition, kind of escaping that old archetype of what a leader should be, and then standing in a very vulnerable place, feeling valid and validated to stand in that place as a leader. Was that difficult for you to make that transition? Was it hard for you to take on this new persona, which was your own persona, it wasn't a new one, but just to feel valid in doing so. It was. I mean, I think a lot of leaders struggle if they get promoted into a leadership position. They struggle with, okay, well, this is kind of weird. Now I'm leading over people that I used to just work side by side with. And so, of course, I've got to now act totally different and be totally different. It's just this natural thought. People are like, mm. okay, well, now, now who is the new me that's mm -hmm. going to be the manager? And oftentimes you see that's a disaster uh, because then that really does breed resentment. People are like scratching their head. They're like, wait a sec, I just work side by side with you. Now you're this different, totally different person. Mm. So I think that um, people need to understand that what people, what leadership is about is having a real clear vision on where ultimately you're trying to go and the organization is trying to go and helping people do things that they wouldn't have been able to do without your help. And sometimes that looks very different. It's, it's helping sometimes to remove obstacles. Sometimes it's helping to motivate somebody. Sometimes it's helping connect them with the right person or the right resources. Um, there's all kinds of different ways or teaming somebody up with somebody. There's all kinds of ways that you help people, but it's ultimately comes down. If I can have somebody better as a result of me working with them or touching their life in some way, then that's leadership. That's positive leadership. Yeah, that's great. That's great. It's really interesting as well, the different influences that new younger leaders are having on the idea of what a good leader is. You know, the millennial generation are bringing a whole new, beautiful range of different skills that has been challenging us older leaders a little bit. And it's a little bit intimidating, but how do you see the millennials affecting the idea of leadership? 
I think that they've helped really evolve the definition. And what I look at is what is tomorrow's leader look like? Right. Tomorrow's leader is very different than what mm-hmm. it's been in the past. Um, it's not somebody that's just leading through the numbers and it's the results and you know, you've, you're just driving the business, the results, the results, the results. Yeah. Tomorrow's leader is somebody who really knows their people and, and understands what's important to them. Uh, they're also very versatile, which uh, the, the only, believe it or not, if you define versatility as, as there's a number of ways to define it, but one of which is using different styles of leadership. There's four yeah. different, there's more, but there's only 1% of leaders that really know, and this is a study that showed this, that really know how to use four different styles of leadership. Most people just gravitate toward one and they use the same style of leadership all the time with every person in every situation, every single day. Hmm. And that just there shows that there's only a certain amount of effectiveness that person's going to have. So I think where the millennial generation has brought an awareness that, hey, you know what? I was used to just using one style of leadership and what I was doing for people in my generation and how I was leading them is not working. And it's because I really have not developed this versatility and ability to work with different personalities and social styles and viewpoints and and everything. So I think that it's the millennials have helped uh, define a leader as somebody who really is much more versatile than they were ever previously. I know. And if 2020 taught us anything is you had strength if you could be versatile, that's for sure. If you were able to pivot, then those are the businesses that did well in the in the struggles. But what are those four? Could you share with us? What are those four leadership styles that you're talking about? Sure. Uh, well, the there's different leadership styles that um, that tend to and there's different examples and I can go into a lot on it. But for example, I'll give you one, which is a more of a commanding leadership style. Okay. Which is, it's more much more of the do and very directive and very OK, just task oriented, no relationship. That was your leader before that you started. Leader. That was who I was when I first mm-hmm. started. That might be defined as somebody, you know, that's an Elon Musk or Steve Jobs kind of yeah. had that mentality. They were very much driver oriented and not not the relationship, not that they don't have other styles, but that was their dominant. Okay. You've got other leaders that are more affiliative, which is much more relationship based, uh, which is much more around the person um, that and it's it's not that it's not about the result, but they're much more about bringing people together. Um, an Oprah Winfrey, uh, a, um, you know, a Herb Kelleher who used to run Southwest Airlines, you know, very much of the people type of person. Yeah. Uh, you've got others that are more uh, democratic. They lead more by committee and collaborative. They're, they're not really the one to stand at the front and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Huh. But they like to assess everybody's feelings and how they feel and kind of make group decisions. Uh, Amazon sometimes works that way, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Google rather, where they'll, they make decisions as committees. Uh, Abraham Lincoln used to work that way. So you've got all these different types, and then you've got more of coaching style, uh, where they're much more of the roll up the sleeves and get into it and help develop you that way, uh, where there's a lot of leaders and obviously a lot of coaches in athletics that are like that naturally. So those are four. There's more, but those are four pretty much the more common ones. So where do you land? How do you find yourself gravitating to which one of those leadership styles? Well, there's there's another style that's visionary, and that's uh, probably more my style is is taught is is thinking about the the where things are going, tying somebody to a vision, and helping that those people in that organization connect the dots of okay, here's what needs to happen now, and here's how this ties into that overall vision. So I'm probably a mix of a lot of different styles, but that's probably more my my uh, dominant one. That's fascinating. I love it. I love it. It reminds me of um, of some. Uh, I was listening to one of your podcasts, and you were talking about these different styles of leadership in your podcast. What do you think are some mistakes that leaders make? I think one of the big mistakes people make is is not matching the readiness with the style of leadership. So, and that results in either underleading or overleading people. Um, we have a tendency much more to underlead people. So mm-hmm. when we give somebody a new task, uh, which which is there's another 
problem, I think, or mistake that leaders make, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, we, when we give somebody a task, oftentimes, and I've been on the other, on the receiving end of this, where I get a task, I'm excited about it. Okay, it's a new responsibility, but I have not gotten the direction or the leadership to teach me how to do it effectively. Then I'm really setting myself up for failure, um, and and you know, there, then ultimately I'm not going to have a lot of success. I'm going to almost resent the leader that gave that to me. And it hurts my confidence because I failed at that. My leader, when I started in, in very early on, gave me the task of running the budget for the organization and uh, leading all the staff. And here I was in my mid twenties. I had no idea what I was doing, but I didn't want to say that. I said, okay, great. Awesome. Thank you but I didn't get the leadership and I failed miserably with those tasks and it, it affected me and, and it was, could have been avoided. So that's one. And then the overleading also, you know, I I'd rather overlead because it usually leads to more better results long-term, but you know, nobody, if, if, if your shoe was untied and, and I said, Hey, turn your shoes untied. And I said, here's what you want to do. You want to take the, the things you want to make the bunny ears. You want right. to turn, be like, well, I don't know. I know how to tie my shoe. Yeah. yeah. And here, let me do it for you. And then you can see how I do it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we've been in that situation where people have led us more than we need to or want, and that doesn't feel good either. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes is mismatching the leadership style with the readiness of the person. Wow, that's fascinating. I, the, that one hit me hard because I can definitely see where I've had that problem in the past of putting people into a leadership position that maybe they just weren't trained for or didn't have the skill set for. And you're right, it can be very wounding, very yeah. wounding. So do you think that everybody wants to be a leader or should be a leader? Or do you think there are some people who just don't want to take that position? Well, I think, you know, whether people want it or realize it or not, everybody is a leader. Is a leader. Because you're influencing yourself. So the only way to say you're not a leader is if you had no control or influence over how you think and how you feel and what you do. Yeah. So I think everybody's first got to understand that. And then they realize, okay, I am a leader and maybe it is just me, but, uh, you know, that's that's, that's their skill sets to learn on how to lead myself better. I mean, we all have things that we've wanted to do that we never did, or maybe we're trying to get in better shape mm -hmm. and we can't stick to a diet or an exercise plan. Well, that's leadership. You know, mm -hmm. tip is about decision-making. It's about managing your emotions. It's about helping you do something that you wouldn't have done otherwise. And, and how do you do that? What environment do I create around me? How do I remove some of the obstacles? How do I partner up with people? Um, there's all kinds of things that I can do to lead myself to do better and more than I would have done otherwise. Um, and then, you know, when I first, when I figure that out, then it's a lot easier for me to lead other people. So Absolutely. I would say the starting point is figure out how to lead yourself a little bit better. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, going back to as well, what you're talking about tomorrow's leaders and how that leadership position or even the idea of being a leader has changed. I think it's true in that regard as well, is that we all consider ourselves leaders from the very basic, basic idea of what that is, means to us in our own lives. Absolutely. And, and, you know, your, your podcast, I love the title, The Business of Happiness. I mean, that's really where happiness comes from. I mean, when you when you figure out what's most important, I, I find most people do things that they don't want to do and they do it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, I find most people are in careers, unfortunately, that they don't like or jobs that they don't like and they're doing it because they're getting a paycheck or that's the reason. Um, and they don't realize that when you have better leadership, self-leadership, then you do things differently. You're willing to take a risk that you wouldn't have otherwise. You're willing to step outside the comfort zone. Uh, you're willing to make better decisions that are based on your core values. Mm -hmm. And you ultimately, as a result of that, you find happiness. That's really, you know, I took a big leap of yeah. faith earlier this year and in 2020, right before the pandemic started my business, which was at that time a speaking business, you know, who would have known that the pandemic would shut down that whole business. You know, I was panicked though. I mean, I'm like, okay, I gave up this great job and started this now new business that from day one, I really can't do. Well, that forced me to pivot very quickly. Yeah. And fortunately, I did some many things right. And it's it's been a phenomenal year, much better than I think it would have been even otherwise. Um, but what I realize now is I'm doing what I love doing I, every single day. 
and I am happy. Uh, and when you are happy, when you're doing what you love doing, it's almost impossible not to be happy. And then the money comes, you know, that's instead of driving after chasing the money and trying to become happy because the money makes you happy. Uh, it doesn't work that way. I know many, many extremely wealthy people that are very, very unhappy. Um, it doesn't work that way. You know, happiness comes from doing what you love and doing it for the right reasons. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I always say when you feel good, you can do good. Mm -hmm. You just can't if you're feeling terrible about yourself. And that was a really big step for you because you were a CEO and president of a financial firm. That's a big change for you. I mean, what did it take for you to make that decision to make that change in terms of your entire career? Well, it, it took a lot and it really took a big, um, it took a realization that if I stayed doing what I was doing, yes, it was the safe and secure route. Mm. I could have stayed for what, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. And, and, and certainly built a lot of wealth doing that with a nice steady job but I wouldn't have been happy. I wouldn't, I would have always looked back and I, I kind of envisioned that. And I said, what will my, how will I feel when I'm 65? And I look back, will I have regrets doing that? And the clear answer was yes. Cause I'll always wonder what else could I have done? I feel like I can impact people all around the world to be better leaders. And if I'm just leading one company, I'm obviously impacting those people, but I can impact a lot more people mm. doing what I truly love. And I just, it was that feeling and realization that I never want to have a regret. And I've had regrets before for things that I haven't done or done, but I, most of the regrets we have in life are not because we tried something and we failed at it. It's because we never tried anything and we never even took step one for something yeah. that we always wanted to do. We, we know people like that. And I didn't want to beat that person. So for me, it was, it became when I thought through that, it became a much easier decision, not easy, but easier decision. And, you know, making that call, you know, pushing the button to, to, to leave and making that decision. I took a picture of myself before I made the phone call to actually, you know, to, to start the process of communicating. Here's what I'm doing. And uh, I, I just kind of like a selfie of, OK, I'm just about to take this big leap. And this wow. is so I've got that captured. And I'm like, wow, it was it's just a crazy moment, but I, I look back and it was the best decision I've ever made. Wow. Wow. Mm. That's great. That's great. So what did you put into place to help you make that change? Many of my listeners have been asking me, what are the things that people do when they make a change? You know, you want to do this change. You realize you can't progress on this pathway any longer. Mm. And what are the tools that you need to be able to make that change? Well, I think you have to, you know, my, my life changed dramatically and making that change. What I wanted to do is make sure that I didn't lose sight because I went from a schedule that was, you know, I'd have 20 meetings in a day. I mean, it was working all kinds of, you know, wow. great, crazy schedule to suddenly I have nothing on my calendar. And now every day I own every hour of that day and what I want to do, but that can also be overwhelming and scary too. And it can lead to a lot of wasted time and like, okay, well, I'm not being productive. So I think what's important is having your daily ritual and what is your routine that you're doing every day. I think when you have, and you start your day with a really clear routine and it's less important what the routine is, it's more important that you have a routine, mm -hmm. uh, then that paves the way for a more productive day. So I think that's number one. And then number two is, you know, you have to, when you're making a change like that, you're not going to know every answer. You're not going to, I think back to what I was thinking when I started, I didn't have it all mapped out. I thought I did, but I realized how vastly different my plan is right now, what I'm doing. I, I knew my end goal. All I knew is, Hey, I just want to teach people how to be better leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, I thought that was speaking on stages across the world. Um, but I, realized quickly, that's just one de delivery mechanism. That's yeah. not my business per se. And so I think if you give yourself the flexibility to say, hey, listen, I don't have to have the plan perfect. I'm never going to know it exactly. And I've got to realize when I take a step into the direction I'm trying to go, sometimes I see things that I wouldn't have seen had I not taken that step. It's like standing on the side of a, of a, of the, of a lake and all I can see is looking out to the lake 
And when I get out there and I start paddling or something on a, on a kayak, and this was actually a kayaking experience I had, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. There's a whole little inlet over there that I didn't see. And I'm like, yeah. it's just the analogy that there's all kinds of solutions, options, ideas that you don't see when you sit on the shoreline. When you take a step out and you get out there, then suddenly it opens up and you're like, ah, okay, now I see this stuff. So I think people have to realize that too. You just got to get started. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So it's interesting as you're speaking, it sounds like you had so much confidence in yourself. How do you know if you're a bad leader? You know, I think, I think people vote with their feet. So if Mm -hmm. you are leading an organization and you have high turnover and you have a lot of people that you, you know, are there and then they leave, uh, that's a sign. Definitely. And you as the leader own that. Um, if you are if you are constantly wondering why people are not moving in the direction or rowing the boat the same way or doing the things that you're trying to influence them to do, then that's a problem. And you have to say, okay, there's something I'm not doing. Um, and ultimately, that's that's what it is. You'll know pretty quickly: are people following you or are they not? Yeah. Um, I think that's really what it comes down to. Do they, are they really just nodding their head in agreement because they feel like they need to, yep. or are their actions lining up with the fact that they really believe in you and they believe in your vision? Um, I know a lot of leaders, I think one of the most important things, you've got to have a really clear vision. If you're leading an organization, I don't care if it's a, a sports team or you're leading a company or whatnot. If you don't have a clear vision uh, and people don't understand where you're trying to go, it's going to be hard for them to do the little things that might be the big things and and the tough things to get there. Yeah. Help them connect the dots. Hey, here's why we're doing this right now, because this is what this will mean. And here's why your role on this team is so important, because when you do this real well, here's what it means. Here's the ripple effect. So great leaders are very good at tying people into the big picture. Um, So I think if you're if you're not seeing everybody moving in the right direction that you're trying to, then there's something that's a good sign that you're not doing. There's something you're not doing right. So if you realize, okay, I've noticed over the past few years, my turnover has been excessive and people keep, we keep needing to hire new people to fill roles that are vacating. What advice would you give for that leader where there's that beginning of that recognition? There might be someone listening who's thinking, well, maybe there's some trends I can see here. So where should people go to become better leaders? Um, well, great, great question. One is they can use the people around them. I mean, mm-hmm. leadership is also about making yourself vulnerable. Ask the people that you lead, hey, can I get some feedback from you? What am I doing that I should keep doing? What am I doing that I need to stop doing? Yeah. What, do I, what am I not doing that I should start doing? Hmm. Um, and, and you'll get some great feedback from people and some honest feedback if you really ask for it. Uh, hmm. You know, that's, that's number one. Uh, secondly is, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that you really need to invest in your development as a leader. Um, you can learn. I've, I've devoured leadership books. Um, I learned a lot through leadership books. They also left me kind of wondering, okay, well, what now? So sometimes I had to kind of connect the dots myself and figure some things out. Uh, But I've always been big on hiring coaches and working with people uh, to become better, uh, a better leader. But I think in reality, you know, it's the greatest thing about becoming and working to become a great leader. It's not a destination. It's a journey. So if I can get 1% better every single week and that's it, then I'm really doing great. And that's all it takes. So so even if I've had a really bad week, I can say, okay, am I 1% better, smarter, more skilled than I was a week ago? And if so, great, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be phenomenal. You're going to be absolutely phenomenal. Don't put the pressure on yourself to be 10% better in the next week, you're not just, Hey, 1%, that's all it takes. And you will be absolutely phenomenal. And your life will totally change. And the lives of the people that you're working with, it will totally change. That's great. So what are, give us titles, two book titles that influenced you in a great way in terms of leadership. Yeah. uh, A big John Maxwell fan. So 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. That's a great one. Uh, I think it's probably the best one to start with because it's just really lays everything out so clearly. Yeah. Um, 
there's been a lot of great books. Jack Welch's books, a big fan of his GE and the uh, Jack, GE and the Jack Welch way or Jack and the GE way. Uh, and uh, Colin Powell had a great book. It doesn't take a hero. Uh, I'm sorry, not Colin Powell, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf. Uh, Colin Powell did have another good book. So there's so many great ones out there, but those are a couple of real good ones. You know, it strikes me, all the books you're naming are all written by great men. And it's really interesting as we watch new and rising women in leadership and influencing our idea of leadership and also changing leadership styles. How do you see this new feminine energy affecting leadership? I will tell you, I've seen some of the best leaders uh, I've seen and worked with uh, are females that are that just... I think that, and I've had a few on my podcast recently, which is the, they've been fantastic. I think, I think they bring a, a you know a different understanding. All, first of all, mm-hmm. and different levels sometimes of empathy, uh, different relationship skills that help them really lead organizations more effectively. Um, you know, and a diff- and just the smarts and the skill sets and uh, ability to be versatile. I think men sometimes have difficulty with that. Men sometimes hmm. have difficulty being vulnerable and, and uh, you know, they put, they, they're more apt to put up this persona sometimes uh, that uh, or facade. Um, so I think there's, there's what's exciting to think about is um, everybody can become better. Everybody has the potential to get a little better than they are. And it's just figuring out, are you willing to, learn? Are you willing to put yourself in a little bit of a vulnerable place so that you can understand how you can get better? Sometimes yeah. you no. Know, and, and then just, again, try and do the 1% better every single week. So what do you think women can learn from men in the leadership arena? Mm. Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if it's a male female thing as much. Um, I think that sometimes, I think men sometimes tend to be, uh, a little bit more task oriented and, and, and less relationship and veer toward that one style of leadership, more commanding. I think there, I know a lot of women that are much, much better than they give themselves credit for. Uh, they tend to, uh, shortchange themselves when they view in terms of how they view themselves. Mm. And I think what's important for them to realize is that it's not, it's so important how you view yourself to being able to lead people. And I, it makes me sad when I see somebody that's so talented and so good. Mm. And the only thing missing that's holding them back from really being an incredible leader is their own self image and Mm. their own confidence level. Mm. So Again, I don't know if that's a male female thing because they both uh, suffer, but I do see a lot of females that that unfortunately don't give themselves enough credit and have the confidence that they really should have. It's almost like other people have the more confidence in them than they do. Um, but if they can figure and I work with people on confidence because that is something you can absolutely develop and there's ways to do it. It's amazing when you see that click and the confidence goes up one notch their results and their influence and impact go up dramatically. I've joked and said, if there was a confidence pill that everybody could take and it would just instantly give you this immense confidence, it would be unbelievable at what people could do and how much effective they, effectiveness they could have as a leader. It's so, so important. So what is something someone could do to gain self-confidence? You have to do a couple things. One is you have to put yourself in a position, you've got to stretch your comfort zone. You've got to do something that you're not comfortable doing because that's the only way that confidence develops by stretching yourself, hmm. having a victory and success with something hmm. and now feeling better about it, doing it the next time. Mm-hmm. So it only comes, it's kind of that double-edged for- sword because the confidence is the pleasure, but it only comes from some of the pain of stepping outside and, and out of your comfort zone and doing something that you have some risk with failure. Yeah. But start small. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything big. If you've never spoken before publicly and you have no co- uh, uh, done any kind of presentations, you know, if you have no confidence with that, don't start with a room of a hundred people, start with a room of three people, mm-hmm. you know, do that. You haven't done that before. Do that get comfortable with that. And then now go to five, maybe 10. Mm-hmm. 
then do that, then do 20. You know, I, I used to have panic, major panic attacks for 20 years of my life. Uh, I had one on a stage in front of 70 people. That wasn't fun. And I literally ran off the stage. It was horrible. Wow. So that affected my confidence big time. And then I had to get back into it by, okay, let me get back. Let me figure out how to overcome these. And it was a confidence thing. And ultimately, you know, speak in front of thousands of people now. And I love it. It's, it's, it's I feel like I come to life when I get on a stage. Yeah. Um, but it starts with just getting little victories. Confidence comes from little tiny successes accumulated over time. And then it's like, okay, wow, I feel like I can do this. So that's simple, huh? Just trying something new, being brave enough to try something new. Do you think that as we get older, that becomes more and more difficult to do? I definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we get, we get set in our ways. We get, yeah. comfortable. we get comfortable being comfortable. Um, and we start to question, okay, do I really need to try this new thing? I mean, you know, I don't want to really do it. And yeah, you know, I'm, I'm too old to get into a new venture or do this, I, you know, and that's, that's just a mindset. Yeah. And, uh, I do think that most people struggle with that as they get older. Absolutely. Know? And it's so funny because I do agree with you. I think it's also the absolute nugget of feeling alive. You know, when you put yourself out there, there's that anxiety and excitement that makes you feel alive. And sometimes we can become so sedentary in terms of our comfort zone just yeah. do the same thing over and over again, that we miss that spark that yeah. gets you excited. And sometimes that is just being outside your comfort zone. Well, and I think that's one of the things also millennials bring you, you know, that, yes. that ad that's so good is there, you know, the days of, I, I think, you know, our parents, they were with the same company for 30 years. You yeah. know, you worked for, you didn't change jobs. I mean, that was just normal. Yeah. Where you stayed to get your pension, that, you know, and now that's so, you know, I stayed with a company for 18 years. I looked at that as a positive, you know, that really wasn't because I wasn't stretching myself. I wasn't really getting uncomfortable enough. And I'm not saying that the answer is hop from company to company because I don't necessarily think that's good, but the millennials are very much, you know, what, what some people used to look at as a negative, wow, they hop around so yeah. much. Well, you know what? The advantage is you are getting a lot of different experiences and that makes you stronger and it's pushing you outside your comfort zone. You're getting into new things. You're exploring new things that you wouldn't have otherwise and maybe finding new passions. You know, yeah. I have people that have gotten into something, they started in financial services. Now they're doing something totally different that was not even on the, on the radar screen. And it was because one thing led them to another, to another, to another. And now they're doing phenomenally well. Yeah. yeah. And I love that permission you gave uh, earlier when you said you don't have to know everything about that arena at all. As long as you get started on it, you don't have to be the expert in order to dive into something new. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I do want to touch on something that you talked about in one of your podcasts. It was just a really great story that you told. For those of you listening, John recently moved from Massachusetts to South Carolina and you had some moving fiasco happen. <laughs> but despite the humor in the story, uh, there are some great leadership lessons in there too. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Tell us that experience. Oh yeah, definitely. That was a, that was a fun uh, episode to tape because uh, it, it helped me. It was therapeutic because I got a lot of my- I, <laughs> You could tell, by the way, I could tell this was therapy for you as you were walking through it. Oh, yeah, it was funny, but uh, I mean, it was, it was a, something like out of a movie. It was so crazy how many things went wrong but at the core what it was was over promising and under delivering that was one made theme throughout this whole thing and when things started to go wrong there was nobody taking the leadership role there was nobody taking ownership and there was no communication i think the most important thing when things start going in the wrong direction you have to over communicate um, when that happens, a lot of, you know, had they simply just said, hey, you know what, we screwed up, here's the things that's happening, the truck is not going to be there for whatever, yeah. can't find your stuff, whatever, I would have been able to deal with that a little bit better. I still wouldn't have been happy, but I would have had more patience, and I would have ended with a better experience. But the bottom line is there was no communication, mm -hmm. and I think leaders oftentimes find themselves when they don't know what to say, they say nothing. When they don't have the answers, they say nothing. And when I think when we went into this pandemic in early 2020, there were a lot of leaders that 
they kind of went radio silent on their people. And that's disaster, absolutely disaster. You need to quadruple the communication, not reduce it in times of stress or challenges or unknown, you know, when the dust is in the cloud, it's cloudy or foggy and people don't know, they need to hear from you. Yeah. And so that's a big lesson. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't know what to say. You can tell people, hey, I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go, but here's what I do know. Mm. Dot, dot, dot. It's okay to say that. And I think that's the big, you know, one of the big lessons in that moving disaster. There just was no communication. Yeah. I think that's so apparent, as you said, during the pandemic. That's absolutely what happened with leaders who were just too quiet and fearful, really, of what they would say and that they might say the wrong thing. And it was the leaders who were a little bit more transparent and able to be vulnerable in their, in what they were telling their teams. And yeah. No, we don't know what's happening because things were changing from week to week, from day to day, from hour to hour. And yeah. it was scary to be a leader during that time in May, June, July. Well, and what was interesting, I had a, a good friend of mine who's a great uh, leader, Jim Meehan, who told me that... Uh, he said, you know, what's interesting is when people, people need comfort, they, mm. they, that's what they look at a leader for in times of uncertainty, they want the comfort of that leader. And he said, I was doing these calls with people. And one of them, one of the people said, you know what, Jim, we'd, we'd like to do this as a video call. We just, just seeing your face makes us feel better. And he's like, wow, okay, that's a great point. You know? And, and so that's something that's, important. Now, this has been a great experience because now people I think are much more comfortable doing these Zoom calls and everything like that. Their whole way of doing business has changed. um, And in a lot of ways for the much, much better. Yeah. um, And that's important and being able to see people, not just talk on a phone, you know, that's, that's key. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's true for 2020 in so many ways is that all these difficulties taught us whole new skill sets that really boosted some businesses in on a trajectory that they weren't on before. If they allowed it, it really gave them leverage to be even greater than if the pandemic hadn't happened. Oh, it's so true. And I'll, I'll be honest, Taryn, I've seen so many businesses that have been thriving. Yeah. Never, and they look back and they're like, 2020 was the best thing that ever happened to us. Um, you know, and to be honest, I'm one of them. I feel that way. Uh, granted, it was a disastrous thing that happened, but I know, you know, my career is is better because of some yeah. of the things that forced me to do. Um, and I'm able to impact people more. But I know a lot of businesses that it, there's obviously a lot of businesses that are struggling and there's some, a lot that are thriving. It's the ones that have really pivoted and really relied and, and asked for help from people, from other business owners, ideas and things on how they can do it. And I'm not, I'm not by any means trivializing the problems, but oftentimes there are solutions there that we don't see. And yes. we have to get somebody else's help. Hey, what are you looking at? Wait, take a look at this problem in this situation. And you let me know what you see. You know, there's a great situation. I told the story. Um, that there was a truck that that uh, got stuck underneath a, uh, a a big eighteen wheeler got stuck underneath an overhead pass like a bridge because yeah. it's just not tall enough yeah. and so it was backing up traffic. I mean, it was like crazy, you know, for miles. And all these people were trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we tow this truck? How do we get this truck out of here? And it was like an eight year old girl that came up with the idea. She said, "Well, why don't you just let the air out of the tires?" Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Then they did, and they got the truck out of there. So sometimes the best solutions are easy and simple, and we don't see them. You know, somebody else can. That's great. I love that. I love that story. It's interesting because I think many of us are so eager to put 2020 behind us, just close the door on 2020. I'm not sure what we're expecting of 2021, but for some reason, people are expecting it just to be completely different. But I think that there are going to be many challenges for leaders going forward. What do you see as new growth opportunities for leaders going into 2021? Or how do you think we, what do we need to be prepared for as leaders in the new year? I think that the rate of change with our world is is going to speed up. It yeah. already does. And the amount of change in 2020, it's been like 10 years of change in one year. Um, I think leaders that are not able to deal with the change and adapt quickly and lead other people through change will get left in the dust. I think they will be extinct. Mm-hmm. I think those types of leaders will be totally irrelevant. 
Um, and irrelevant is a horrible word when you are a leader. You have to be relevant. And uh, I think the leaders really of tomorrow, tomorrow's leaders are very, uh, they, they live for change. I mean, nobody necessarily likes it, but they learn to live with change as part of every day. They're very versatile. They're thinking about their businesses and their organizations in a very fluid way um, and thinking outside the box too, uh, not thinking linearly, 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 that's a tough word to say, <laughs> but um, that's, uh, it's really kind of a, this 3D world and 3D mm. changes. It's not just, you know, what the old world was five, 10 years ago, just not, doesn't exist anymore. Change is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. There you I, go. Uh, one example is just the, the whole concept of there's so many leaders and I was one of them for a period of time where I'm like, okay, well, we can't really run that type of business virtually and everybody's got to come into an office and this is how we run mm. the business. That's not the case. You know, yeah. most people are realizing that now because they've been forced to realize that now, but uh, the smart leaders will not wait to be forced into realizing something. They'll seek those opportunities out before those changes come to them. They'll be ahead of it. So we'd love to read more about you and follow you further. You have so many great things to say, and I'd love to find out more about you as well. So tell us about how we can find you online and the book that you've written, please. You got it. Well, if they Google me, John Larito, they'll see uh, I do podcasts. I have my Tomorrow's Leader podcast, which uh, I do three episodes a week. One, one I bring on a guest and just uh, you know, ask them every question that I wanna know about their leadership and what they're thinking and how they do it. So it's a learning opportunity for me as well as to pass on to my audience. And then two solo episodes where I take examples of things sometimes that I'm dealing with with some clients and coaching people and leading organizations and, and, and teach different concepts. Um, so that's one way they can subscribe to that. It's also, I'm also on YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, and then the others, I've got a book coming out. So uh, also called Tomorrow's Leader. And that's uh, my first book on leadership. Um, as I mentioned, I always kind of read leadership books and was left with that question of now what? Mm. So what do I do with this? So this book is really a very different book. It's really designed to be very actionable. Um, I wanted to, to answer that question for people. There's a lot of stories in there. I'm a big storyteller. Yeah. So I think it's a fun, easy read on leadership and what will it take to be part of the top 1% of leaders in the future and then action steps you can take. So here's what I need to do to work on this skill and, and get better. Uh, so that's actually coming out, I think in a couple of months. Well, by the time this comes out, so should be in, uh, in early March, uh, right. it will be out so people can, can check me out and uh, go to my website, laritogroup.com, L-A-U-R-I-T-O group.com and put themselves on the list. So we'll make sure we get a book out to them. So we can go onto your website to get our name on, to get the book in well, March. You can email as of right now, it's, it will be on the website very short, shortly. Sure. As of right now, they can email me or just email okay. us and let us know. And we'll make sure that they get first notice of when that book has come out. Awesome. And we'll let our uh, business of happiness podcast hive know when that happens, our private Facebook group. So definitely sure. we'll alert them as soon as that book becomes available, because I'm sure it's going to be so valuable to so many of our listeners. So thank you for that. Good. Thank you. So my final two questions for you, John, number mm -hmm. one, what is your superpower? I think I have a, a good ability to really understand people. And, mm. um, I think that's probably what I do better than anything. So I'd have to say that. Oh, I love it. I love it. And then my second question to you is, if your book was gone, even though you worked so hard on it, if your website was gone, if all your coaching materials disappeared and you could leave us with just one message, something that would inspire future leaders, what would that be? I think the most important thing is you have to have passion for what you're doing. And if you don't have it, then you've got to find the thing that gives you truly passion because passion is an amazing ingredient of life and it's infectious, it's contagious. And it, I, I, the best leaders I've ever known are incredibly passionate. If they had one thing and that would help to make them happier and more effective leaders, it would be passion. Awesome. Couldn't agree more.
Couldn't agree mm-hmm. more. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you. Oh, uh, my pleasure, Taryn. I appreciate you too. And I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. Your message is so, so timely. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing it with us. And thank you so much to all of you listening. Thanks for joining us this hour. Happy 2021. I can't believe it. Happy 2021. And join us again next week. Next week, we're talking about, um, oh, I can't believe it. Let me see. I've got it up here. As you were speaking earlier, I thought, oh, that's so perfect. Painting a portrait of success. There you go. How to paint a portrait of success for your team. So I look forward to sharing all of that with you next week. In the meantime, happy new year and join us over on the Business of Happiness podcast Hive on Facebook, the private Facebook group. And we'll see you again then. Today is going to be a great day. Bye-bye.